Want them now? Yeah. Of course, it's been, what, 40 some years ago? Or better? So, what? if war broke out, what was your life expectancy? Seven minutes. And where were you? At that time, I was in Germany. And in New Jersey. New Jersey. Yep. Um, so, it was the Nike Hercules, right? Right. So, can you, like, elaborate? <clears throat> The Nike Hercules was an air defense missile with a nuclear warhead. About what size was it, about the payload? Uh, they were about the size we dropped on Japan. So like 10, 20 kilotons? Uh, around 10 to 30. 10 to 30. So what were these for? Like More like defensive, trying to shoot down the missiles coming here? or? No, they were for shooting down airplanes. Oh, airplanes? Yes. You needed a nuclear bomb for airplanes? Yes. So would you just get like the whole fleet at once? They were designed to take out a whole squadron of usually propeller driven uh, bombers. So like World War II bomber, you know, flying fortress and all that stuff. You could take out a whole squadron of those with one Nike Hercules. Hmm. But uh, since we were rapidly Moving into the jet age mm -hmm. in 1961 to 64 that I was doing it, uh, they were starting to become somewhat obsolete because of the supersonic. You couldn't quite catch up to them? Well, the Nike Hercules, I believe, would do Mach 3. Mach 3. That's, but, pre that's still pretty damn fast. Yes, indeedy. But uh, if you had a bunch of airplanes... Uh, 50 miles out. Alright, so what was your relationship with the missiles? Okay, I was a launcher uh, crewman. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were about five of us on the launch crew. And basically, uh, you would be in an underground storage area that had missiles in it, and you would roll them onto an elevator which would bring them to the surface of the ground where there are permanently mounted launchers. So you would roll them off the elevator onto one of the launchers, hook up cables and so on, and because I was tall enough to reach the warheads, I was designated as the one to open up the warhead hatch, take out a big round plug with a green ribbon on it, which was a safe plug, and plug in uh, a red plug with a uh, red ribbon on it, and plug it into the warhead, and then close up the hatch again, as well as miscellaneous other duties. Did you like? Did you do like maintenance on them and stuff? Well, when we were doing the day-to-day -day checks, there was everything from uh, tube-operated uh, equipment. And some of the equipment needed to have the voltages checked on some of the tubes anywhere from every four hours to every day, depending on what kind of uh, alert status you were on. If you were on a five-minute alert, you would have to check the voltages and stuff every four hours. If you were on... Uh, oh, they had six-hour alert time. They had... Uh, Day, uh, one day alert time and so on. So depending on your alert status, you were doing either routine maintenance and that was everything you can imagine from uh, checking the hydraulic. Uh, there was a very high pressure uh, hydraulic lines that uh, elevated the launchers and you would have to do timing tests to see how fast it raised and lowered and that kind of stuff. You had to do, um, periodically, there were a bunch of access panels, and you would have to open them up and check the wiring and different things inside. So there were a million little putts around things that you did every day. And then there were things that you did every month. There were things you did every six months. There were things you did every year. Such as? Uh, everything from checking there's... Uh, a auxiliary power supply in the missile 
and there's a lanyard, there's a booster rocket that fires with uh, these um, rocket motors that are solid state. But when they drop off, they pull a lanyard that activates this uh, short-term, high-power uh, power supply, but it runs with a turbine, and there's a type of um, uh, explosive, or near, almost like rocket fuel, but it when you activate it, it ignites itself. So when you pull the lanyard, this thing goes, Wah! and it screams like a jet engine, but it generates a hell of a lot of power, which is enough voltage to energize the nuclear warhead and all these other things. But because this generator, pound for pound, generates much more power than batteries, uh, it's good for, you know, maybe 10 minutes or something like that. But if you're launching the missile, if it doesn't blow up in 10 minutes, it's, you know, too bad. <laughs> so once the, it's activated, um, it goes crazy. But if, and there have been occasions when somebody accidentally caught their foot or whatever on the lanyard and pulled it and <laughs> set the thing off when it wasn't supposed to go off. Oh. Yeah. Uh, and then. Was the little warhead live on it? Uh, no, the warhead is not activated okay. until you put the arm plug in. Okay. And then there are other safety measures um, because you don't want it to come back down and hit friendly forces on the ground. You have uh, sensors. Right, go. Okay. Uh, if the missile is launched and you lose your uh, target that you're pursuing, the airplanes or whatever, mm hmm or it has electronic uh, interference or whatever, and you miss your target, and the missile is coming back down, it senses its altitude. If it gets down to 10,000 feet or below, then there's an automatic safety cutoff to keep the nuclear warhead from going off. But um, there are ways to set off the nuclear warhead without it going nuclear, but going off like a standard explosive bomb, but it'd be you know like a one or two um, kilotons, not kilotons, oh. one ton bomb. Oh, okay. Because there's maybe. A, but it would still be nuclear. No, it's uh -oh. non-nuclear. Okay, I got you. But it would blow up with the nuclear material in there and scatter it around, so it'd be kind of like a dirty bomb. Okay. But it would be non-nuclear, so being a dirty bomb would you know cover a relatively small area. Mm -hmm. with relatively low level radiation compared to a nuclear explosion that uh, would cover a much larger area, like dropping it on Japan or someplace like that. And since we were right across from Coney Island in New Jersey, if it, we aimed them out over the ocean because that's the direction you expected bombers to come mm -hmm. across the Atlantic, so it was away from New York out over the ocean, but um, it's feasible you could redirect it back towards New York or New Jersey or wherever, mm -hmm. and uh, so on. But um, there were ways to rig them to have ground impact, but then you had to do some internal adjustments, crush rings and different things to get it to blow up on physical contact with the ground. But uh, that's the decision that, you know, it wasn't really an option for us because it was too hard to do. <laughs> but um, there were all kinds of things that you did uh, from taking out, there's two pounds of gunpowder in the igniter, a big round disc. It was so almost uh, eight, ten inches across with two pounds of gunpowder in it. And those were electrically ignited when you launched a missile, mm -hmm. and that would fire the gunpowder down the core of the solid rocket motors that were the booster rockets, mm -hmm. and there were four of those. And once a year, you had to take those out and do electric connectivity tests on them. There were places on the launcher when you raised the launcher and so on 
there were little shear pins and different things that hold the rocket on the launcher. Mm -hmm. But they're supposed to shear when the rocket launches. And there are tolerances on, uh, you would have to use torque wrenches and all that kind of stuff to see if the bolts were torqued at the proper torque setting. You had to use a feeler gauge to feel if the uh, spacing was appropriate for where it was. There were all kinds of these little adjustments and so on and so forth. But um, then there were electronic cable tests and different things that you did. And we had a, uh, an air compressor that would go up over 3,000 PSI to pressurize our hydraulic system. So we had, if the air got in the hydraulic system and it's squealing and carrying on, you had to bleed it down, reload it with uh, hydraulic oil, and then repressurize the system with 3,000 PSI to make it go faster. But uh, there was a pretty big motor on the compressor for the hydraulic system, but this 3,000 PSI made it go even faster to raise the missile. So there's all kinds of little things like that. And then you end up with guard duty and all kinds of, you know, Mm -hmm. Barracks maintenance and you know all these other all the, the regulars. Were there any other missiles or nukes you worked on? Just or just the Nike Hercules? Just the Nike Hercules. What was the range on it? Uh, about eighty miles plus, but uh, about eighty miles was the effective range. It could probably go a little farther than that if you, depending on what you were shooting at, and its altitude and different things. But mm -hmm. then. Then I was transferred to Germany. Would uh, you work on missiles there too? I worked on the missiles there too. And as when I first went over my... So this would be West Germany during like, you know, when it was split in two. It was down close to Luxembourg, about 10 miles north of Luxembourg. And close to Trier, Germany, which was an old Roman town. With Roman ruins and baths and all that fun stuff, Colosseum. But anyways, uh, while I was in Germany, they ended up with a shortage of radar operators. Mm -hmm. And I said, I raised my hand and said, I'll go be a radar operator. And they said, okay, you can transfer over to the radar section because we're short radar operators, but we have enough people to, for launch crews. So I transferred to the uh, radar section and basically, you would follow somebody around for about a month to learn what they were doing. So it was learned by watching, and then then whoever was teaching you what to do, uh, after a week or two, would sit behind you or stand behind you and watch what you were doing. If you made any mistakes, they would say, hey, you did that wrong, and so on. But um, anyways, uh, I ended up being a target tracking radar operator and there was a big long console and there were three of us that sat mm -hmm. at the target tracking radar uh, thing and basically my job was to control the altitude of the b missile no oh. the radar oh the rate okay i was a radar operator okay there was another radar that tracked the missile Okay. And there was just one operator that had his radar locked on the missile. Okay. Because you would send instructions to the missile during flight. So it would maneuver as it's flying. Because the bombers are coming in and they pick up that you're locked onto them. So they're starting to do evasive maneuvers and countermeasures and all this war game stuff. Yeah. So they're diving and turning and going crazy. Mm -hmm. Well, our missile has to go up, arc over, and dive down on them. And as it's doing that, it's continuously feeding information into a computer from my radar and calculating where the intercept point would be and sending those instructions back up to the missile in flight. So it would maneuver to try to keep up with the countermeasures the enemy were doing. But because there's electronic interference, 
one of my jobs was to control the magnetron of the radar and change its frequency and power settings. If we were starting to pick up interference on our radar, I would twiddle with the uh, magnetron controls to try to get off of their jamming signal into a clean area. Mm -hmm. But there were uh, three operators. I controlled the elevation. There was another operator that controlled the uh, azimuth. And there's another operator that was working on range and these other things. But then there was a search radar, and the search radar is one of the ones that goes round and round and round like you see on the weather radars and so on. And that would pick up whatever aircraft were in the area. And basically we had the IFF, the friend-foe identification stuff, and you would have to lock in codes when they opened up the war. Um, you know, if you're going to war, there, the officer of the day would open up the safe, get out the codes for that day. The launch codes? It's not the launch codes. Uh -oh. It's the IFF codes. Okay. Because the, if the airplane is flying and you want to know if it's military, civilian, enemy, you would put in these IFF codes and they changed on a daily, sometimes hourly basis. Okay. So... That's what the so officer that, of the day would say, okay, these are so the way, IFF codes, that, so, so we know if we're shooting at our planes, civilian planes, or enemy planes. And they changed a lot, so that, that, so that way the enemy cryptographers couldn't figure it out? Well, there's a lot of codes, you know, it's relative peacetime. Uh, we didn't expect to be going to war. It was 1971, 72. But then the Cuba Missile Crisis hit when they were starting to put uh, long-range ICBMs in Cuba. So you were in the military for that? I was. I was in Germany at the time. During the Cuban Missile Crisis? Right. So basically, uh, that was very close to going to a nuclear war. And things were starting to change. Just before I got out, they were starting to gear up for Vietnam, so things were starting to change. But while I was in from 61, for the next three years, it was pretty much, you know, a lot of boozing, a lot of drinking, you know, uh, marching, you know, we were where they would uh, have parties and ceremonies for retiring officers. So in the summertime, we would have kegs of beer and so on and go out and march and play the band and all that fun stuff for somebody that was going to retire. But uh, in the meantime, we just kind of goofed off a lot. <laughs> but that's the way it goes. Sometimes you're, you know, seven minutes from not being here to, you know, all the beer you can drink. <laughs> so there you go. Alrighty.